ingredients into world-changing companies. We're a completely volunteer-run organization who seeks to be inspired and educated through this technology leadership. And we would be um, thrilled to have you join us for a program later this year. We have two more coming up. Uh, the next one in April is Meet the Angels, where we will have the head of all the angel organizations on stage, and they're just open for questions. And then the final program in May is on biotech applications for 3D printing. The volunteers that make this program possible include Brian Crouch, Jordan Gow, Jim Casteris, Callum Kammer, Shirley Bundy, Gregory Martin, Paul Meehan, Jaime Mendez, Eric Mulver, David Moss, Adam Schuster, Ben Liegraff, and Tuol Zhang. Please give them a round of applause. <laughs> and if you would like to become a volunteer yourself and become involved in this organization, feel free to come to one of us uh, with one of these flappy green things, and we'd be happy to uh, chat to you about that. Uh, we're also a membership organization, and there are uh, membership cards out there. We're going to be starting our uh, season planning for next year. And so the, uh, uh, feel free to sign up for one of the memberships and we'll keep you informed as we develop next season and some of the programs that are, will be starting in September. The sponsors uh, of this program include our premier sponsor, T-Mobile, lead sponsor, Artifact, uh, STEM sponsor, T-Mobile as well, and then in-kind sponsors of Freelock Computing, the MIT Club of Puget Sound, DLA Piper, Puget Sound Video, and program captains, Stoke Lawrence and Buddy. Uh, we also have Grant Thornton as a season sponsor as well. So we're really excited about this particular program because we're looking at a city in a way that we're not commonly, through a lens that's not commonly looked through, and that's primarily through the sensor networks, IoT, and how AI can be used to bring these cities together, closer with their citizens and empower their people to live more fulfilling lives, drive innovations and technology. And our MC of tonight who's going to be help walk us through that is uh, Heather Lewis, who is the director of the Social Venture Partners Fast Pitch, and has a long experience in innovation of technology at ProMotion, at UW, and a lot of other places before that. So Heather, the stage is yours. Hello and good evening. I'm very excited to see you all here tonight. As Jimmy mentioned, uh, this is the Enterprise Forum, and we are focused on connecting cities, data, and citizens. We have a lineup of three speakers kicking us off. So we will hear from a representative from the philanthropic, private, and public sectors describing the work that they're doing in the smart city space. Following this, we will have a panel discussion and we'll be adding two presenters who I'll mention in just a moment. So our first speaker tonight will be Loriana Marciance. She's the project manager at the Smart Cities Challenge Initiative at Vulcan. Her topics will include an overview of what is a smart city, the role of philanthropy in smart city technology development, and a feature from the Smart City Challenge winner at Columbus, Ohio from last year. Following Loriana, we'll have Stan Curtis, who is the VP of Systems at Urban Systems. And his topics will include his timelines for smart city deployment, Examples and lessons learned from smart cities pilots in Mastar in Hong Kong, featuring smart cities as a platform. Last but not least, we'll have Michael Matler, the CTO of the City of Seattle. And he will focus on uh, emphasizing partnerships with the university, community, and corporate sectors. He will also show a video on smart cities partnerships and focus on the City of Seattle's efforts in the civic tech scene. Finally, he will conclude with his, a showcase of his regional work with Rainwatch and Seattle 24. Then they will be joined by two additional panelists, Greta Knappenberger, who is the Director of Smart Cities and IoT at ISOF Stone North America, and Claire Haig, who is the Senior Product Man Marketing Manager at Socrata. I am going to turn the stage over to Loriana, who will help educate us on smart cities. Good evening. This works. Okay, so I'm here to talk to you about Smart City Challenge. Um, but I want to tell you a little bit about Vulcan. Um, I hope that everybody is 
a warrior. I think if you live in the Seattle area, you know who Paul Allen is and some of the things that Brooklyn does. Um, we work, we own, we, he owns uh, the Seahawks. I like the we. <laughs> I have a little corner of the world that I'm going to talk to you about, but you know, in the space that we live in, we have scientists that are working, trying to develop um, the world's um, largest commercial spacecraft. We're trying to discover the brain, um, counting elephants to protect them. So there are amazing things happening in the universe, the Paul D. Allen universe. And my little space of the world is the philanthropic um, initiatives, which is within the climate and energy portfolio. I focus specifically on transportation, which is where the Smart City Challenge uh, resides. So, so what do I care about? I care about climate change. <coughs> I care about that as of last year, the U.S. is the number one source of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and if you look at the trajectory of vehicles miles traveled, um, they are projected to keep increasing. This is problematic. Um, we're not going to be able to solve this through smart growth or urban form or transit um, or bicycle, pedestrian. <coughs> These are all important solutions, but the only way we will reach our climate stabilization <coughs> goals is to electrify our transportation system. And that is where we, where we started um, for the Smart City Challenge. So this is our theory of change. How do we get to a low carbon transportation? Um, so we need to accelerate adoption rates of new technologies, zero emission technologies. Specifically in the transportation sector, it's electric vehicles um, mainly. We're ready for commercial deployment. But you can also think of um, fuel cell vehicles if it's, um, if it's powered through renewable energy. There are other options that might have come up in the next 20 years. But as of now, we need to focus on the adoption of electric vehicles. So, Sadly, in the United States, even though we have electric vehicles, needs and leaves um, around since um, 2010, as of last year, the EV market share was less than 1%. And so what do we do? Um, we try to figure out what are the ways that we can accelerate this adoption curve. <coughs> there we go. So this is what we're trying to achieve. And this is a very, and you might be familiar with this curve. This is a, the innovation model of new technologies. And so you're trying to target your, what is the overall market share, but also it's um, innovators who first adopt the technology, early adopters, and then you reach early majority as your critical mass. And so as a philanthropy, we try to figure out ways, how do we support technologies um, that are going to have a positive impact on society, and how do we help them overcome um, early market risks, for example. So here's more of a, our toolbox, and this is what we try to do. We design programs that will catalyze leadership, um, municipal leadership, local policy action, um, then continue to foster public-private partnerships. Cities cannot do it alone. The mayors really cannot um, get to a transformation if you don't have partnerships with universities, with the private sector, with major employers. It, it's, gonna, it's really all hands on deck. Um, so we specifically look at mitigating early market risks for these technologies to show a positive impact in the world, overcoming resistance from incumbents. And so who are the, um, they're, they're actually, we're actually uh, battling the internal combustion engine. And there's a lot of people right now profiting from that. Um, technology, and so we have to think about what is the transition that is going to be helpful, most helpful, the technological transition, so we think about it that way. And then just as a philanthropy, we share best practices, effective policies, we just try to share it broadly so that these technological transitions can occur more quickly. And so in the space of the smart city, I'd like to, um, oh, there it is. <laughs> So this is where we started, um, and you're going to see a video of what we, not what I believe, but what mayors of the Smart City Challenge finalists um, and people within the Balkan and the USDOT, how they define the Smart City. A Smart City isn't just a city that generates 
cool technology. I think a smart city is also a city that thinks carefully about how all other people play into this whole challenge. There is so much potential for looking at different types of programs and projects and different ideas that are out there that can be a benefit to cities throughout this country and throughout this world. More than any other challenge uh, that this city faces, it is mobility. You see the areas for rematching and transportation everywhere you look. We must be really smart and thoughtful about how we plan out moving people about the city. We can impact their health and safety by making these investments. We can use intelligent transportation systems and the technology available to help move families out of poverty, reconnect them to employment. Cars are going to be able to speak to each other, and that's just going to make everything much more efficient. Getting people out of vehicles and into public transit is a great thing, but anything that we do that encourages people to actually have human contact and interaction is better for us. Cities have a great opportunity to be at the forefront of testing and trying new ideas and ideas that we can share not just among cities but bring to scale much more so nationally. Our transformation of the transportation sector is only fully realized when we're using low carbon or even zero carbon energy. If cities become greener, then we change the world. We change the climate by what happens in cities, and that's pretty important. If we can all work together, we can disrupt the current trajectory of climate change. So what we're hoping for is to catalyze markets for great new technologies and services in order to accelerate that transition from a carbon-based economy to greener sources of energy. We're very excited about these cities. We think they're going to tell a great story about American innovation and about how decisions at the municipal level can shape better mobility choices, better quality of life, and a better transportation system for our country.
city is really how you apply these technologies. It's not just the technology. It's what are you doing with them? What are you trying to do with it? And obviously our interest is not that to make Columbus the smartest city in America. We want Columbus to lead the way and teach all cities in the US how to be smart about their transportation systems and about everything else. So keep track of Columbus because we hope to be expanding our program as soon as we have some uh, learning opportunities and uh, see what else we can transfer to others. Cities. Uh, MIT was a co-sponsor of a research project at NASDAQ, and that was uh, the Green Energy first meeting of the World Future Energy Summit, and they were looking at transitioning their oil-based economy to something more intelligent, and they picked MIT, and we were fortunate enough to be part of that project too. So it's great to see the video, and it's great to see the platform that, that Columbus and Vulcan are helped incubating with the United States. National Institute of Standards. So I will try to talk a little bit about um, four topics. A little bit of the history of Smarter Planet, Internet of Things becoming Smarter Cities Focus, and then the solution to Smarter Cities involving more open standards and the ability to replicate solutions from city to city. And that's Columbus is one of the cities that looks like they're going to be able to help with the replication, so that's very important. And then a little bit more about the challenges and some of the solutions around privacy. So one of the things we found with smart meters was that people didn't really like to be monitored if they can get some benefits. And so David Musk knows all about that in California. Um, and then also some ideas about how to scale. It's very difficult to do a smarter planet. It's also difficult to do a smarter city. But it's much easier to do a smarter neighborhood or a smarter campus. And so we have some uh, research that we can leverage around how to incubate those uh, smarter opportunities at different scales and give a little bit of background on some places where that's been done. So one of the very first things, that, one of my favorite pictures about smart cities is the comparison. Well, I'm an engineer by background and I actually work with the AI lab at MIT quite a bit on expert systems. So, you know, the technology of transportation, I thought nothing can be more expensive than a railroad. It's huge capital upfront cost. It goes really slow, doesn't care that many passengers. And if you guess wrong on where people want to live, mm -hmm. it's hugely expensive to expand the railroad tracks. And I was working with the urban planners of Portland that are big advocates for, instead of bus routes, train installations, I couldn't figure out how they could pencil in the ROI of the trees. You know, it's very simple. You spend a buck on the train, and the private sector spends a hundred bucks on real estate development, and they know how to do, if you've invested in the train track, they know how to invest in a really good quality neighborhood. And then it was a self-fulfilling ROI story that because you committed to the neighborhood with your train, they're going to commit to the neighborhood with a really high quality building. And so the building, Green Building Council here in the Northwest is very famous. The Cascadia Council has come up with many of the green smart city technologies and standards. And you know the green building people have realized it's sort of a 330-300 rule. <coughs> 30 bucks a, a, a month is your cost for electricity. 30 bucks a month is your cost for getting, it's much more important to get the building leased. And 300 bucks a month is that the people that are there are productive. So the high-tech companies all know this, and that 3300 rule is kind of part of the smart city. And Seattle's famous for realizing that if you open a ditch, you should put fiber in it and get the total community benefit of opening that ditch, whether it's a water ditch or a smart grid ditch or a cable ditch. So this chart is very interesting to me, the smart city programs when you compare a city like Barcelona with a city like Atlanta. They both decided to do the carbon emission transit kind of upgrade to uh, better, better electric services. 
And they both spent the same amount of money on a transit system, subway system, light rail system, whatever. And you can see in Atlanta, they were only able to cover like 10% of the population. They still got a lot more to go. In Barcelona, they covered the majority of the people. And you can see these cities are actually the same size. One's a little older, so you think it might be more expensive in Barcelona. But the benefits of Barcelona doing this are so much higher. So you can see why just doing a smart city technology project doesn't give you the guarantee that it has particular value. You've got to really do it to the template of the city that you're on and the value of the neighborhood that you're working in. So Atlanta is going to be 40 times more expensive to do this type of approach to upgrade their transit system. And then the transit system, as Vulcan knows, that's the most expensive subsystem, more expensive than grid, more expensive than common. So you've got to get that right to get the, the density right. So this is a very famous picture that you know density matters, and some cities have a much better chance to do a lot more choices uh, than others. The smart grid uh, carbon program, it's actually they see neighborhoods where they'd like their family to live, and actually their kids want to move. And so it's that kind of thing. When we were incubating stuff with China, which has a new one belt, one, one road program for every city in China, not just Columbus, but Shanghai, Beijing, Hong Kong, 400 cities are bigger than Columbus in China. So, so in China, they are incubating their program, and they've looked all around the world, starting with New York and Chicago and London and Amsterdam, at showcase models for this, and they ended up picking Portland and the Pearl District. Why? Because they like the parks. Because we have it for each. <laughs> because we have traditional Bhutan kinds of stuff. And so one of the things I think is important for transit, here is our metro model of, of integrating in a, across multiple cities a shared transit system. And that's a pretty famous you know, urban growth boundary uh, resolution. But on the right, and a lesser known thing, is Olmsted Parks. We were the first city to have an Olmsted Park plan for our whole city. Seattle also has an Olmsted Park plan, and Olmsted did Central Park in New York, and he did 50 other cities. I don't know what he did in Columbus, but he did you know, cities in every state. So if you look at templates that can be reused for smarter cities, where you get engagement, he really focused on the park as a center of activity, and we see the open spaces as well as the transit systems. The transit systems kind of make natural plazas for people to exchange modes of, of transportation. So what was originally sort of thought of it by Metro as a transit stop sort of became an Olmsted Park. And if it was a good park, then it was a good transit stop, and that became a very active, interesting thing. So my, set, my sister lives up here, and she's been working on restoring a historic property at San Michelle Winery. It's a great party place. And I encourage you to go out and take a historic tour. She offered to give anybody here a a personal tour. And she's also now very active with the Olmsteads because Seattle has many Olmstead parks and that can be the seed for many neighborhood plans. So we are very interested in incubating you know the Olmstead story and helping you know incubate this into the smarter city, smarter city programs. And one of the research topics that I've worked on around uh, these these uh, projects, especially with with uh, Hong Kong coming to visit Portland. When they look at Portland, they think they see the clean air, so you don't have to argue about carbon emissions. They know it's not Beijing. And they see tall trees, just like here. You know, they, they, would, they see that. And, they, um, and the other thing they see is really makers, but not makers of like robots, but makers of beer, or Starbucks coffee, or you know, distilleries, or food trucks full of stuff. So one of the things we, we've seen in a lot of the research around smart cities, the 330-300 rule, is really much more around wellness and uh, fresh air and lifestyle choices, especially for the 51% of the women. And then also um, around food, that actually, you know, if you do the research on healthcare and elder care, which are the some of the biggest economic issues in China as well as the US. Um, zip code correlates to wellness better than genetic code. 
So precision medicine is actually exactly the way you're working on. Thank you for funding it. <laughs> and you know, I think Seattle and Portland and Vancouver are really showcase the wellness communities. And that's why people like the Green Building Council recommendations. So anyway, this is a European chart on um, what they think of when they think of a great place. They actually are designing the food economy. And we're really famous for food to table. We got some of the best chefs. You know, Seattle has some of the best, you know, oysters and seafood uh, standards really change the whole food industry uh, with your, your, your guy here. So, so I wanted to, to, uh, to leave you with the thought that smart cities aren't just, you know, neighborhoods block by block putting in the right restaurant or putting in the right green building or putting in the right green car. It's actually putting in the right green space for the right kind of activities. And when people feel like it's got birds and got great, great uh, species of trees and plants and flowers, um, I went through the botanic garden while I was up here. I mean, there's amazing stuff up here. That's why you know, people want to live here. So one of the one of the plans I found that has been really important for for Portland. I'm sorry about this. I must not have. I need to upgrade my windows. <laughs> uh, is the Culinary Institute? So you know, James Beard. When we hosted the smart, when we hosted the uh, supercomputing global conference in Portland, five years after Seattle hosted it, um, people were really interested in the James Beard food scene. And I think you see, uh, this is the same thing in, in Hong Kong. People like the different kinds of culinary food. So actually part of the economic development for a lot of European cities, and, and I think part of the economic development story for, for our cities, Portland and Seattle, is our food scene. We have great produce, we have great chefs, and important is the, the zoning the zoning laws that allow food carts to be the incremental thing. Because they had wheels, they could move around in the zoning. And because they were configurable, they could be owned and started up. And so there's actually a whole program for incubating last mile services, which is the challenge, and incubating better places to live. And food carts and food pods and better restaurants and better oysters, all that stuff I think is very compelling for that in the Northwest Colony Energy Institute might be as useful to incubate as genetics. So I really love this picture. This was uh, a showcase from the night from um, <laughs> one of the smart city researchers, Carol Coletta, and uh, the Knight Foundation doing Memphis and a lot of the middle, a lot of the river city um, uh, uh, updates. But they love the treasure truck. So you know, something that's sort of like a theater. We have in Portland the uh, Hollywood Theater District that grew a whole great place to live around refurbishing an old theater. And then Amazon's got this theater truck, the treasure truck, and Amazon's leading a lot of the best delivery of drones and stuff for the last mile problem. So I think this is a very cool picture of Seattle could almost pod by pod, truck by truck. Hong Kong's looking at container reconfiguring for low cost housing. But I think this whole uh, truck kind of delivery thing would be very cool. And of course, it's about the apps, being able to get what you want. We get, probably in my neighborhood, in Lake Oswego, we have Amazon trucks in the neighborhood all day long, and we get a delivery every other day at our house. And it's a really quality of life thing. I get way better ghee butter. I get way better uh, choices of, of what I want. Uh, and it's also a low carbon thing. I don't drive a long ways. It's being shared across me and my neighbors. It's a very good carbon footprint. So I just wanted to sort of wrap up with this kind of lessons learned on connected city with data and citizens engagement. That we're living really in what's being called the Anthropocene era. And it's not because of cars that it's Anthropocene. It's because of the ring around the bathtub that our behavior has created. And it's not just carbon. I mean, we've killed off all the species. You know, we're a third of the mass of the species on Earth. And of the other two thirds, over half, you know, 80% of those are the species that we eat. So we're really dominating this whole thing. It's really our behavior challenge. And city by city, we have a chance to really improve that. And we've known for some time how to get the right density of behaviors to get this win-win, high return uh, model. There's been a million people in Rome and Beijing, all these same patterns have been incubated all over the all over the world. 
and most of them came before cars, so we had a hope that eventually we could get back back to those conditions. Mm -hmm. For those MIT guys, um, there's a lot of research on the complexity of cities and the paradoxes of transportation, the Brea's paradox, the faster you build the freeways, the more cars you have in your cities. The Jevon paradox is the same for smart grid. So utility by utility, there's these paradoxes that are famous math proofs. And then Santa Fe Institute has also modeled the overall paradox of <coughs> complexity of cities, that there's really a power law of scaling up of cities. And, um, and then the surprising recent thing is, oh, this power law for modern cities is the same as the power law for old cities. Might be our behaviors. <laughs> and so that's actually what has been found. And this is the 2017 uh, recent uh, key trend chart for economic development, city by city, from Deloitte. And it shows, uh, it's basically a proof of Jane Jacobs' theory of smart cities that the marvel of living in a city is that it makes ordinary people extraordinary by putting them in a network where they can share these kinds of activities. And this just takes, you know, the idea of complexity models is there could be a common cause. The Pareto power law is a few things probably cause most of the things. That's the long tail and the powerful few. That's the 80-20 rule. So what we're finding is that, you know, Eleanor Ostrom was right when she got her Nobel Prize that if we had a common platform where partners were willing to work together and reuse successful components, and then like Jane Jacobs, if we were actually building up communities that had local rebalancing of, of services, we'd really have an amazing place. And then this is the parallel curve of, uh, you know, it's not the technology that's the limit. That thing is going really fast. The challenge, and actually the business models are changing. Amazon can create new business models. It's not the Amazon business model that's the bottleneck. It's really our policy stuff. So thank you for incubating policy, and thanks to MIT for trying to get this to happen in Seattle. Very eager to help. Thank you. Chief Technology Officer for the City of Seattle. And before I start, I just have to say how conflicted I am that we spent the first session talking so much about Columbus, Ohio. <laughs> As a native of Columbus, Ohio, and uh, wait, we'll try something real quick. OH? Ohio. Thank you, okay. <laughs> um, I am very glad that, that Seattle is uh, following in some great footsteps with Columbus, and we look forward to dealing with collaboration ourselves here and what types of partnerships um, will yield really great benefits for our public. Before I jump in, I'd like to share with you uh, a short video of one way we think about partnering to create a smarter city. Mm -hmm. What are you doing this weekend? How would you like to be locked up with a bunch of computer hackers for three straight days? These guys would. You're the data experts, you're the startupers, you're the hackers, you're the commuters. We can't wait to see the data that you put into commuters' hands. This is Hack the Commute, a City of Seattle event to come up with the next great idea to improve on our local transportation system. And boy, does it need help. Seattle's transportation problem is really unique. It's a very, very fragile system that we have. A lot of that can be solved with or helped mitigated by technology. Depending on the data side. There are so many creative people in here, not just in transportation, that have a lot of skills that you know, folks in the city government might not have. Unless you've been living in a cave for the past 30 years, you probably noticed that transportation is perhaps Seattle's greatest challenge. When it comes to livability, getting anywhere is its Achilles heel now the fourth worst congestion in America. The local landscape is priceless, but it makes for limited corridors and a lot of water to navigate around. And with all the booming growth, particularly downtown, commute times keep going up and up and up. Change for operating at the These guys just might be our saviors. Essentially, we're trying to figure out 
Uh, best commute times from near your work. Yeah. Their best ideas are going to be pitched to a panel of judges who can't wait for their show and tell. We're making it cool and easy to use for not only the people on Third Ave, but for communities like Columbia City or, or 23rd and Jackson who might not have the capability. Writing code for transportation apps sounds so simple. Okay, let's run that server. Let's watch the magic happen here. We're trying to take the real-time GTFS data from one bus away. We're running it through a custom model view controller framework that's going to let us display it in a somewhat different way that hopefully will let people make better decisions about what route they're going to take to complete a specific uh, trip here. If you understood every word he just said, you must work in the high-tech industry. <laughs> Bus capacity, downtown parking, best bike routes, ferry ridership. There is a long list of transportation topics looking for improvements. I've been riding buses and riding bikes in the city for over 20 years. And I've given them a lot of thought on the, what I do today uh, world, and I love the advances in, in the data that's been out there, but I've never really gotten into it. And this is a chance to dig into it a bit more. This team, Bike Racks, went beyond crunching the data to build their own technology. It has a, a rangefinder used to detect the buses, and then that plugs into any camera or phone and can you know, take a set of five photos. The idea is to use imaging sensors at bus stations to let bike commuters know ahead of time if there is rack space available on the next bus. If not, it may be faster to bike all the way than wasting time waiting for the next ride. Elevation, especially downtown, is a real problem in this city. If you have a manual wheelchair, it's really hard to get up there. Stairs aren't marked on those Google Maps. They just look like park and roads. For the weekend, we, we fixated on uh, the bus's full situation. So reporting that it's full, overcrowded, and it's going to pass by. What's most impressive to me is just all the passion these volunteers bring to the table. These are people who have day jobs that are very busy, and yet they are so passionate about making the Seattle a better place to live and work. They spend their nights and their weekends going out to think about how data and how technology can improve the lives of whatever. It's just it's wonderful to see. 17 competing teams, three days to give birth to genius, and in those 72 hours, there is probably about a million keystrokes on laptops. There certainly is more tapping than eating. Most hackers grab something to nosh on and then forget that it's there. Right now, you could go to various other uh, places, different apps, all these uh, places, but it would all be located in one spot. By Sunday afternoon, the teams have most of their acts together. <laughs> Mentors help them polish their presentations. All of this is a way to say when we work together, we can come up with amazing new ideas, and there's no reason why Seattle can't become a leader in civic technology innovation. <laughs> Sunday night is showtime. So as a driver, when you're coming into downtown Seattle, you don't have to circle a block a bunch of times. You can drive directly to a parking spot and not be part of that 30 or 40 percent of distracted drivers who are in trouble. We wanted to let people use their cars and still make better community work. And so we want to do just something that's informal, on demand, and trusted. And so that's how slow it's more. So if I'm sitting at the bus stop with one bus away, I can see not only is the next bus coming, but also that there's, thank God, there's two spaces available. Or maybe I just have to suck it up and bike all the way. Finally, the moment everyone has been waiting for, announcing the three finalists whose great ideas move into further development. The first team was Geohackers for Good. The second team was Slug. And the third team, Hacksizzle. Is, is inherently a, a like public good, and this is a city that cares about public goods perhaps more than other cities. One of the reasons I like being here. If you take the, the technical skill set and the focus on public good, that's a great uh, hybrid. Just for anyone that wants to multitask during the rest of this talk, um, that last team called Accessible. They're now called Access Map. You can look them up in the Seattle Times or Crosscut. They have now spread to multiple cities and they have received grant funding. They're being incubated out of new dubs. So, a really cool success story. We'll circle back to that in just a minute. Okay. iTunes. Oh, there we go. Like so many other cities, is aspiring to become a smart city. 
So what can we do about it? Well, if you look at buildings, do our building owners understand their energy consumption? And so our Office of Sustainability and Environment within the city uh, partnered with downtown building owners. We said, what if we work with you to help benchmark your energy consumption against your peers? We collected the data. I'd like to actually bring up real quick uh, James Rufo Hill, who is a climate change advisor in Seattle Public Utilities, uh, to talk about one of our really great academic partnerships with the University of Washington. Thank you, Michael. So, Seattle might be known for its rain, but the truth is, we're not designed, our stormwater infrastructure isn't designed for all the types of rain that we do get. It's, it's mostly designed for the drip, the kind of rain that we've seen every day since this <laughs> February 1st. Um, a short period of time in the life of the city, and as we saw from the intro video about Hack the Commute, those new people are driving some real challenges around how we all get around our city. So who better to help solve the transportation problem uh, than those who are both causing and most affected by it? And that's where this notion of hackathons and civic technology come into play for us. Uh, many of you, show of hands, who has been to data.cl.gov? Awesome, that's not enough hands for David Doyle. There's our open data manager, talk to him. We want to empower our community to help be part of any solution. If there is something going on in the city um, that someone is passionate about solving, whether it's transportation or otherwise, we want to make our data available. Um, it's a notion that we call being open by preference. And so when we thought about it, go wrong. Well, as many of you may know living here in Seattle, we are a community that cares deeply about civil liberties and privacy. And it's one of the reasons we've seen so many protests over the past few months um, as our government has been changing in this country. And it will not surprise you that when members of our community see new devices go up on utility poles, they tend to ask questions. So in 2013, as an example, we received an Uwazi grant from the Department of Homeland Security to mount new surveillance cameras around our waterfront, just in case of the invasion you know, in LA Bay. <laughs> I wasn't at the city at this time. Um, we also, and you can see on the right, we were providing backhaul for these cameras through a wireless mesh network, you know, big Wi-Fi hotspot. So what could possibly go wrong when we throw these up and not tell people? Well, some members of our privacy advocacy community said, surprisingly, they didn't focus on the camera, but, but that was me. Um, they focused on the Wi-Fi mesh network and said, oh, it's Wi-Fi. That means if I connect to it, then, then the city will know my MAC address, and then they can triangulate to track me as I move through the downtown core. Um, it was an interesting thought, too bad that um, number one, the network was locked down so individuals couldn't connect to it, and number two, we got a letter from the maker of the, the equipment that said that is actually not technically possible to do with the hardware that we bought. Now, despite the fact that we had the letter and we could provide the config files, the story stuck. Um, that network has been turned off since 2013, and our city council passed an ordinance that said if you want to turn it on, you must come to us first. So, when we failed to engage our jail times in my first month on the job, I was very quick to tell the mayor and the media, don't worry, the city would never track you by your cell phone. It just, it's something we would never do. And then about six months later, I learned about something that our Department of Transportation did. Um, <laughs> so you may have been walking in the downtown core at any one of those little green dots on the map and seen one of these rubber antennas in the lower left-hand corner that say Skyway on them. Um, you know, SDOT had a really great Smart Cities application. They said, hey, we want to be able to provide better situational awareness of traffic in the downtown core. And rather than installing the really big pole-mounted cameras that have to look down to your license plate to see when you get from point A to point B, we're going to use your cell phone. We're going to capture your MAC address as you move between time and time. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to use that information to calculate um, the speed and distance traveled and, and give us general congestion information. Um, again, we forgot to tell people about this. And so what happened? <laughs> the inevitable story hits, and again, we have to go hat in hand to the public and say, yeah, we, we messed up again. But something interesting happened this time. As compared to the prior time where we struggled to say why we were trying to monitor Elliott Harbor for the invading ships in the night, um, <laughs> this time we pulled up our phones and we pulled up Google Maps and we said, you know what, yeah, we are tracking you through timing points, but by the way, here's the privacy controls we've implemented to prove that the data is um, salted and hashed and anonymized um, and only able to be used um, at an aggregate level. 
And you see that Google map with red, yellow, and green for traffic? Don't you like having that? If you like having it, we have to capture some data somewhere. So we proved the utility, we proved the value of what we were doing, and that we were doing it in a secure manner that respected uh, personal liberties. And the story went away in a day. This was one that was just really bad for anyone who lived here. When we started flying drones and not telling people. <laughs> so those are three examples of, of why we do need to stay focused on, on people as we consider smart cities. And so what's next for the city of Seattle? Well, we do strive to become a smarter city, and we do want to bring more people um, into our collaborative uh, vision for what that looks like. And we also recognize we're a bit behind. We don't, uh, well, we did participate in the US DOT Challenge, and we put together a really fantastic coalition. Um, we do need to get out to the public and listen and understand what the vision